Welcome to RICO 12. I'm Justin, your host and a grateful child of an all-powerful and all-loving God. RICO 12 is all about exploring the common threads of addiction and sharing tools and hope from those on this same path. We gather from diverse backgrounds, faiths, and places to learn and support one another. Our speakers represent various fellowships, addictions, and afflictions, reflecting the richness of our shared experiences. Come join with us in this journey of recovery and unity. We're grateful that you are here today. Today's speaker for the 208th meeting is Dennis T., who has been a previous speaker on meetings number 16 and number 75 a while ago. But man, powerful, powerful meetings and messages. And his topic today is the four absolutes in step 10. And we'll get to his talk in the Q&A afterwards in just a minute. First, I have a little bit of business. The RICO 12 family of Re recovery resources is expanding with more support for both addicts and their loved ones. You can go ahead and explore additional RICO 12 podcasts by checking the chat in our live meetings as well as in the podcast show notes. We're also exploring the possibility of creating some resources in multiple languages worldwide. If you are in long-term recovery and speak a language natively other than English and are interested in hosting a RICO 12 meeting in your native language in the future, contact us at RICO12POD at gmail.com. That's R-E-C-O-1-2-P-O-D -E -O 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 -P -O at gmail.com. RICO 12 is a self-supporting service, and we appreciate your contributions to help us continue our mission. Thank you all who have donated recently and in the past. If you'd like to join in and support RICO 12 and become a spearhead, please visit rico12.com forward slash support for one-time or monthly donation options. Your support makes a difference in sharing our message of recovery. Uh, we look forward each week and in each meeting, to receiving from the light reflected from our speakers. That light inspires hope, meaning, worth, and growth in us, the listening audience. Now I'm going to introduce our guest speaker for today, Dennis T. Here's a little bit about him. Dennis T. comes to us from Alaska. His sobriety date is July 29th of 2014, and he suffered from sexaholism, drugs, and alcohol abuse for more than 45 years. And he, that was to find freedom from the pain of early childhood sexual abuse. By the grace of his higher power, he is living free one day at a time through working and practicing the spiritual principles he found in the program of recovery. His hope is that in sharing today, it may help one person find a way out of the torturous, torturous bondage of their hellish addiction. And in this in this meeting, make sure you've got your big book here, the fourth edition of the big book. Um, he's going to be going into that. Have it ready to read, mark up and take some notes. Take it away, Dennis. The floor All is right. yours. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Justin. And I just pray that I get out of the way and uh, I'll take this next step and leave all the results up to God. Today, I was asked to come and share about my experience with the four absolutes. This is not an exhaustive. This is just my experience and uh, it may be different than others. And that's OK. Um, the four absolutes are absolute unselfishness, absolute honesty, absolute purity and absolute love. And those are the things that I would like to share around today that I found. Um, I do my 11th step prayer every morning. And from that, it's once it becomes a part of me, the meditations, I start seeing it all around me. And I see how it interconnected with these four absolutes, and how the big book interconnected with the four absolutes, I could start seeing where oh, wow, this is exactly what they're talking about there. So I'm going to attempt to share that a little bit with you. Um, the purpose of the four absolutes for me is so that I can be with God in a, in a closer and more powerful way. That's what I, um, to practice the four absolutes gives me that ticket into that um, stadium. I often think of a like a football game or a soccer game, there's a stadium and I was on the outside of it. And as I come into this program, um, I always knew about what that there was something going on in there. But as I entered into this program, I actually got invited in and I was stuck in the farthest back seats from the field. And, and I was, it was amazing. I was so happy. I was so excited uh, just to be there. And as I kept working the steps, I kept getting invited. The little usher would come up and say, oh, come on down here. And I kept getting closer to the field. And it was just like, and it was just getting better and better. And these four absolutes, as I continue to practice them, and not perfectly, by no means any of this program, I don't practice perfectly, but it just continued to 
bring me into a closer relationship. And what I realized, and then we're going to talk about is uh, something that I like to refer to as the shrinking circle. That when I come into this program, man, the protection and power of God was, I mean, a huge circle. And I was anything I asked and God was just there. And I call it, it's what I've been told that's called the pink cloud. And then all of a sudden the pink cloud just was gone. And I was feel like I was just out there vulnerable. And I didn't realize that God was bringing me closer to him. Like, oh, I got to get over here closer to God to get the same type of protection. And I didn't realize it, what was happening. And when we get into the resentment portion of this, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But that is the whole purpose of this program. That is the whole purpose of the four absolutes is as that circle continues to shrink, that the purpose that God's doing is bringing me closer and closer and closer to him. So just a quick recap. Step one, that I'm powerless over my, in my case, lust. My definitely drugs and alcohol. My life is unmanageable. Um, I had going through the doctor's opinion. I learned that I have a twofold uh, disease. That my powerlessness is that I have a um, the grave nature of my illness is that I have a f uh, allergy of the body. That if I take any lust into my system, whether it be a look or a thought comes to mind, if I entertain that, I'm going to experience. The, the effects of that disease. And the bottom of the doctor's opinion on XXVII, it says that I'm restless, irritable, and discontent. Unless I can again experience the ease and comfort which comes at once by taking a few drinks. Um, the truth is I'm already restless, irritable, and discontent before I take the drink. And that's what this, that's the recovery side of the program is why am I restless, irritable, and discontent? And instead of uh, I'm restless, irritable, and discontent unless I can again escape. And a lot of what I see now, even though I'm not struggling uh, at times or most times with any lust, no drugs, no alcohol, I still need to escape or I want to escape at times. And that's is where my uh, program is at today. It says my life is unmanageable can be found on page 52 in the um, uh, bedevilments. And I heard the other day, I loved it. When we're reading these, we turn them into questions. My sponsor had me turn them into questions. Am I having trouble with personal relationships while sober? I can't at times control my emotional natures while sober. I fall prey to misery and depression while sober. I have a feeling of useless and I'm full of fear. I'm unhappy while sober. The reason I think that's important is because sober is not well. Sober is me just not using my medication to get the relief of being disconnected from the power. And so we move on and we go into the we agnostics. And when I first heard we agnostics being from a faith strong tradition and my, some of my sponsors are, well, I'm not an agnostic. Well, Bill didn't say we atheists. He said we agnostics. And when I got into this work, I could see, especially on um, page 53, and I'd like to just walk through this quickly, and uh, hopefully we can get through all of this. It said, when we became sexaholics or alcoholics crushed by a self-imposed crisis, and we're going to find out, and we're not talking about alcohol anymore. We're talking about the self's will. We could not postpone or evade. We had to fearlessly face the proposition that either God is everything or he is nothing. God either is or he isn't what was your choice to be? And it said, arrived at this point, we were squarely confronted with the question of faith, not belief here, because faith, if I'll turn and look at what is faith, it's relying upon. What am I truly relying upon? Am I relying upon this self's will that's been trying to take care of me my whole life? Or am I relying upon God? If I step to shore and ask for this self's will to be taken away, um, and am I going to just truly, as it says at the end of the third step prayer, we thought well before taking this, that we were utterly ready to be uh, to utterly abandon ourselves to God. It said we couldn't duck the issue. Some of us already walked over the, the bridge of reason. And that capital R, when you see a capital, it's a power we're talking about. And even though I'm all in, I'm stepping to shore, I find myself at times back on the bridge using escape of some sort. It could be binge 
binge watching a series, it could be food, it could be something else. And it creates a noise in me that doles down my, the presence, the consciousness of the presence of God, that I want that. And sometimes I'll wake up and instead of that, just that flowing of God's presence, there's this noise, it's like doled down. And I'm like, what's going on? And I realize that I'm back on the bridge because it says the outlines and the promises of the new land. That means where I'm fully connected and living without that uh, fully connected to God had brought luster to tired eyes and fresh courage to flagging spirits. The friendly hands, those that have already on land said, come on, because we were grateful that reason had brought us so far, but somehow we couldn't quite step ashore. Perhaps we'd been living leaning too heavily on reason that last mile, and we didn't like to lose our support. I just was working, we, me and a sponsor were working together just the other day. He's been through his 12 steps. We're going through the traditions. And he mentioned something. And we went back to this section and we went back over it. And I said, what's keeping me from giving up these things that are keeping me from fully being connected to God? Because he said, well, I prayed, but I felt so I went and ate some cookies. And the, the cookies are the escape that I use. And so in my recovery today, I want to look, where am I trying to escape? And why am I trying to escape? What's going on? Um, and so that awakening to really be able to see that, am I stepping back onto this bridge? And what am I willing to give up? In my disease, I'm, I would say, what am I, how much can I keep this and have God? And that's the process of, I believe, the four absolutes to where I can eventually continue as that circle shrinks to just go closer and closer to God. I'm going to jump ahead now because we're going to get back onto page 84. We've done our inventories. You know, we do our third step. We make a decision to turn our will and our life over to, and I believe the important is the care of. That means I'm going to rely upon God. Even if I'm suffering, even if I'm afraid, even if I'm uncomfortable, I'm not going to go back to my escapes. I'm going to stay in it, stay in a place where I'm uncomfortable until I can feel that peace of God. And uh, so in the 10th step, we did our um, house cleaning through the inventories. We shared that with us so that I could get the full revelation of, oh my gosh, this self's will is so deadly. This morning in our meetings, I could hear where this person and this person would be, you could hear it beating them down. And I thought, man, that's the illness right there. I'm so thankful that I had a sponsor. I left one sponsor of six years to meet with this man. And I prayed about this and God showed me a man with a book in his hand. And I said, okay. And I went and talked with my other sponsor and there was tears, but we were in a lot of sadness. And I went in here and he showed me, no, Dennis, put the apostrophe S by, you know, that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that it's self's will. Like the first, it says on page 60, that the thing, the first requirement is that we be convinced that any life run on, and it used to say self will can hardly be a success, but he had me put an apostrophe S, yes, self's will. We went through those 12 steps for the sole purpose of truly seeing how is this self's will beating me up? You know, we come into meetings, we're like, oh, we're thinking it's the lust, it's the alcohol, it's the drugs. No, but the whole while, when you have the awakening to how deadly self is, it's our worst enemy. And then we go through that process into the fifth step that just really opens that up. Six, seven, and eight, we make our amends, and we end up back here on 84. And this is where uh, what Justin had asked about. So on step 10, 84, this brings us to step 10, which suggests that we continue to take personal inventory and continue to set right any new mistakes as we go along. This is four through nine in a nutshell. We've already cleaned out all of a lifetime full of garbage that's been keeping me blocked off from God. And now we're going to do this on a daily basis and we're going to practice these principles. You know, back on 64, it talked about at the very top, when we come into this work, we'd already learned that we we're being driven by this self's will. It tells me at the very top sentence, it starts, though our decision, which was to quit playing God, to turn my life finally over to the care of God, was a vital and crucial step. It could have little permanent effect unless it once.
followed by a strenuous effort to face and be rid of the things, this self's will, which had been blocking me because my liquor, my lust was but a symptom. So we had to get down to those causes and conditions. And I believe that's the truth as we enter into here that what am I being blocked off from God today? Or what's causing the noise that's dulling it down? God never leaves me. He is always there ready in a moment's notice when I'm willing to finally uh, let go to give up and to give it to him to just flood in and take care of me. Instead of me, I, I can't tell you the awful burden it is to try and run the world, to try and take care of me, to try and plan everything out. It's so painful that I do need my drug if I'm going to live there. If I'm going to stay in control, I need some way to medicate that. And there's no shame in that. It's just that I'm I'm relying upon self again. We vigorously clean, commenced this way of living as we cleaned up the past. I've made my amends. I went to those that I have harmed. And any time I'm in self's will, I'm going to harm others. We've entered the world of the spirit. That's where I'm connecting with God. And when God is flowing, I'm going to talk about this a little later, everything is different. Our next function is to grow in understanding and effective. This is not an effectiveness. This is not an overnight matter. And this tells us how long I'm going to practice this for the rest of my life if I don't want to live in my self's will. So I continue to watch. And here's the four absolutes. When I seen this, I thought, oh, wow, there it is. The four absolutes are absolute unselfishness. So above selfishness, I write unselfishness. Absolute honesty. Above dishonesty, I write honesty. Absolute resentment. Above resentment, I write purity. And absolute love, because above fear is love. And I'm going to kind of go through these. A little quicker, I'm running out of time. Um, what is this purpose of my selfishness? Why am I this? You know, why am I so into my selfishness? And why have I been? Well, it's because I'm trying to get and to take care of me. I don't believe this self's will is evil, although some call it the enemy. It sure looks like it, but I think it's just trying to take care of me. I don't know what would have happened in my life if I didn't have lust, if I didn't have drugs. If I didn't have alcohol to try and medicate that. So this selfishness is an attempt to fill the God void. I was talking with another individual the other day and realized he said, well, Dennis, there's also a need to have connection with human beings. I said, so there's two voids is the best way I could see it. Um, so this selfishness is there because it's the best it can is taking care of me. But the problem is it manipulates others. It harms others in its thing because it will do whatever it can to fill that God void. My poor wife, uh, I try to fill my void with her, like my codependency, um, needing her to make me okay. And if she's sick enough, she'll try to do that. But thank God she's got a good program now. And she can recognize that she can't be my God. The honesty when I look at that, absolute, what is absolute honesty? Well, I believe there's absolutely honest with others, and I have to be absolutely honest with myself. When I, if I share a sentence, and 100% of the sentence I share is 100% is true, but I leave off three words, um, the dishonesty is I can detect, oh, there it is, their self worried about, well, if I say the whole truth, I don't know the result of that. So absolute honesty means that I'm just going to rely upon God and tell the truth, no matter what it is. Um, I'm going to, you know, the other day I was snow blowing my neighbor. He's really old and he's sort of blind. And I, I nicked, I mean, I just bumped my thing up against the back of his truck and it was a scratch, like an eighth inch. And I tried to rub it out and I thought, man, he'll never see it. And as I did my 11 step prayer, I said, where there is error, let me, let me bring truth. And I thought, oh, I could never pray that again. It's going to bug me. I thought, Dennis, you got to tell him. You got to just call and tell him, hey, I scratched it. Whatever. If I need to replace this bumper, it's a nice truck. So I just got on the phone. I said, hey, um, man, I snow blowing your driveway. I bumped your thing and there's a scratch. And I said, that's the only scratch that I'm ever going to have in that truck. No problem. I appreciate you. And I was free. So what honesty, absolute honesty brings us is freedom. Um, 
And I have to wonder, why am I leaving off the last three words? Well, because I'm still trying to control the outcome of something. If I'm trying to manage and control an outcome, then I'm back into self's will trying to run my life. And I have to give that up. I have to know that whatever that truth brings, as long as it doesn't harm another person, um, is exactly God's will for me. And I get to trust that God's will is always perfect. It may not be what I think, but always if I'll go through whatever it is on the outside, when I come out of it, I'm like, oh my gosh, I see now. I'm closer to God. I have an awakening. God may close one door and open another. That door that God opened is always better. And if I would have held on to where I was at, I couldn't have received what God had for me. So resentment, I put purity, absolute purity above that. And if you read the um, eight points of the Oxford group, they have other parts of it. But for me, how it applies, I'm only sharing my experience today, is purity of heart. And one thing I could see as I was going through my process is, man, I can't disconnect my heart from another human being. Um, when I disconnect my heart from my wife, I suffer. Um, if resentment, I remember when I first went through my um, my work and I was into my 11th step, I took a prayer walk. I would ask God one question. I said, each day I would ask him something. I said, God, what's, what is resentment? And man, it came down strong and hard. It's unforgiveness. I thought, whoa, I thought it was being angry at somebody. No, resentment is unforgiveness. And if I'm unforgiveness, I've shut my heart off from that person. We have in our book, uh, in the essay book, Recovery Continues, it's called the resentment lust connection. It says, why is this whole disconnection resentment game destructive? Because when I sever from person, I'm severing from God. The two always seem to go together. I can't do damage to one without doing damage to the other. Also, this kind of severing is a conscious attitude against another, and thus an inner act of violence. But the only one inside of me is me. So that inner violence damages me. That's why I feel so bad when I do what is wrong. Man, there, this is one thing that I can't even have a little resentment. Sometimes I'll start like feeling the effects of a thought will come to mind about a temptation. I'm like, whoa, where did that come from? And I'm not wanting it, but I say, God, what's going on? And it's like, you have a little resentment towards your wife. And I'm like, wow, that's so small. But you know what? Um, if I have any, I'm going to need to medicate that. I'm back in my self's will. I once said, had a secretary. I knew I'd be late for a meeting by about four or five minutes. I put my paperwork on my desk. I ran and uh, went out, did my business. I let the the the, uh, the uh, meeting know. I come racing back in. I open my door and it's gone. I'm, I'm and I'm talking to myself. God, where is it? And I know I laid it right here. And I heard my secretary laugh like this evil laugh. And I finally gave up and ran down to the meeting. And said, Hey guys. Because I'm presenting. I said, man, I can't find my paperwork. They said, oh, Dennis, your secretary let us in your door. It was locked. And we grabbed it so we could kind of get started. Oh, I had such a resentment. I walked out of there and got in my truck. And I said to her as I walked out, I hope you enjoyed that. Got in my truck. And I got hit. Like in my recovery at that point, I was maybe getting hit what I call a level two, level one, lust temptations. And since day one coming in here, if the moment the thought comes to my mind or I see something, if I'll say, God, I'm powerless, I need your power, please lend me your power just for today, um, God 100% would give me 100 would give me relief. And I'll save it for another things. If I pause, what happens? I take, if I entertain the thought or take the look, that poison goes into my body and that phenomenon of craving kicks in. But God always removed it. So I got into my truck, I was driving off and I got hit with a level 9.5 and I'm like, ooh. So I said, God, I am powerless. I need your power. Please lend me your power just for today. Nothing. I'm like, God, what's going on? And I prayed again, nothing. And I said, God, help me. What's happening? He said, and this is my understanding. I'm not going to say he said like I heard some audible voice, but he said, Dennis, when you first came in, that circle, the umbrella was wide. And you didn't know a resentment would cause this. You would pray and I'd take it. I said, but now that you've done your four step and you know, you have the tools to pray for that woman. And I said, God, did you see what she did? 
and he didn't answer. <laughs> Nothing. So I did my four-step prayer work on her. And I'm telling you, I felt nothing but love and compassion, never to be brought up or charged against her again. I walked into that building, said, and it was very kind. But the minute I was done praying that, there was no lust. I didn't need to pray for anything else. That's how deadly, that's why purity of heart is so important. When I separate from my wife, even a little, I suffer badly because, or anybody, because I get back into self's will. Um, love that goes above fear, absolute love. There's two states of being, and I'll try and close her up here. I got five minutes, I see. When I'm in self's will and I'm trying to do the best I can to run, my self's will is trying to run my life. I'm living in self-centered fear. How horrifyingly uh, terror, terrifying is it to try and run life? It's it's beyond what a human being is meant to do. Or I could live in God-centered love. And God-centered love is that when I step from that bridge to shore, I feel peace and serenity. I could have some major things happening in my life, and I feel peace and serenity. Um, I remember early on reading out of 417 through 420, it was a daily reading, that acceptance is the answer to all my problems. Well, then I said at that point, well, I'm just going to be in acceptance today. Never happened. Never worked. It's once I stepped ashore, all of a sudden, I just had acceptance. And it wasn't something I'm doing. I'm no longer living in my brain. I'm living out of my heart and my spirit. And it's just everything's different because that's God. That's how God works. I feel love and compassion. I feel patience. When I first got into this tent stuff and it said continue to watch, I intellectually tried to continue to watch. I would be so deep into resentment. I'm like, oh, wait, wait, there it is. Now, when I live in the spirit, I don't look for it anymore. I look to see a, 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 a movement in my spirit, a disturbance of something. I feel it in my spirit first. And then I know right away, God makes aware, you know, am I being uh, unsel Am I being selfish? Or am I kind of hiding something, being dishonest? Am I, do I have some, uh, my heart, do I have any resentment? Do I, have I disconnected from another human being? And am I in some type of fear, anxiety, and not trusting God in this? So these things are what lets me know whether I'm stepping back off of the shore, back on to trying to start to control things. Um, I was going to say something that just dawned on me. So, and I think that's because I'm out, but so the purpose of these absolutes, the four absolutes, are so that I can stay on shore with God, that God can fully connect me, uh, that I can be fully connected with God. And in all of the places in the book, it says, you know, in our seventh step, is so that I can be of usefulness to my man. On page 77, it talks about my real purpose. And if you look on 77, it's the second sentence down. It says our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and the people about us. I was taught by my sponsor, you know, my real purpose isn't to be of maximum service to God and the people about us. My real purpose is to fit myself and through that tenth step, through those absolutes. That's how I'm fitting myself. And then it says to be. Well, once I'm connected and I'm fit, to be of maximum service and to God and the people about us. Listen, God is in, in me. I'm just a channel of his peace, like out of the 11th set prayer. I'm going to go through my day and God's going to use me to help this person to do a kind word here, to be a service here. He's He is in me and, I'm, and he's going to reach out and touch them. It's nothing I'm thinking of. It's no knowledge I have. It's just me being open to letting him use me however he will. I, for myself, my real purpose is to fit myself so I can be with God. That's what I want. I get so much joy out of just being with him. And when I find myself stepping onto the bridge, starting to medicate again, I'm in my agnosticism because now what am I relying upon? I got one minute. What am I relying upon um, is that self's will again. I wish that I could just say, God, I'm ready to step on shore and never step back off. But I don't know that I, 
so far in my experience, I, that's not possible. But more and more as I practice these four absolutes, I get to stay on shore longer. And when I step off, I want to stay on there less time and hurt less people when I'm there and I get to go back. And so that's why I'm going to continue to practice. When I look at where I want to be, I say, man, I'm not where I want to be, but I thank God I'm not where I was. And every day I move a little forward. I want to not look at where I'm not. I want to keep focus on, thank God I'm not there. And thank God that I get to be used because when he's using me, I get the front row seat. I'm experiencing his presence. And I'll close with this. It's like a, a large reservoir that I had empty. He fills it with crystal clear water. And I feel the, I feel just uh, the love and everything from it. If I don't open that channel up, if I just keep it for myself, if I don't work with others, if I don't love others, then that water gets stagnated. So I open it up and he can then flow through me and out. And whatever flows out, there's 10 times more coming back in if I'm willing. So that's why I work my program every day so that, yeah, I don't want to go back to where I came from. It's a real possibility if I don't work it. But I do it now because I love being with God. And if I will continue to let those four absolutes penetrate my heart and then I can become aware of them, then I can live uh, more and more each day uh, being a, a channel of God's peace. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Dennis. I really appreciate your share there, the insights that you shared with us, the, you know, walking through the big book on some of these things with us, really helpful for me. I've written a few questions and I've gotten a couple questions in from our live audience. A reminder to our live audience, if you have a question for Dennis regarding what he's spoken on, please type it in the Q&A link at the bottom of your Zoom window. It looks like two speech bubbles over the top of each other and we will get to those. I'm going to start off with a question that came in from our live audience. This is from Shay. Shay asks, what have you found to be the effect of looking at watching for the opposites of the four absolutes in step 10, you know, selfishness, dishonesty, fear, and resentment. Are there parts of the program where you can look at, look at it the other way around? I don't know how to answer that question, to be honest with you. Um, the opposites. Here, here's uh, actually there's a little clarifying here let me read this too and see if this may help out why is focusing on the negatives of the four absolutes in step four and ten important rather than the positive of it why maybe maybe that clarifies things you mean to see like where i or like i'm trying to spot the unselfishness i'm mm -hmm. trying to spot the honesty i i don't know um i guess it would be like if i focus on the problem the problem increases if i focus on the solution the solution increases um I think these are ideals and ideals are benchmarks that I will never be able to reach. I don't know that I can actually focus on those individually. What I can tell in my spirit is when I'm disturbed about something and that disturbance, I ask God, God, what's going on? And he can reveal those because a lot of times I may not know I'm in fear. And that's what's so great about praying about it and talking with somebody. And if I'm in fear, I get to call and share that with somebody. Um, I, I don't know exactly how to answer that. I apologize. Yeah, no worries. Thank you, Dennis. I appreciate your, your walking through what you got there. Um, and I don't know that I could answer it either, but, uh, it's good stuff. Okay. So one thing that I, that I really, um, uh, well, I'm going to, I'm going to ask this first question first, and then I'll get into something that I really appreciated about what you shared. You know, some people will say, Hey, you know, uh, the words absolutes, the word purity aren't necessarily found in the big book. How can we reconcile, you know, the, this message with the message of the big book? And, and also the word purity is often related specifically to sexual purity. I really love how you put it above resentment there. Talk to us a little bit more about purity and maybe that concept that I talked about and things in the big book and not in the big book. Yeah, I love that. Um, there's a great little thing if you look up the four absolutes where dr bob's saying before the 12 steps were written they operated out of the four absolutes that's what kind of their program that they strived for to to live up to to practice was the four absolutes and uh, those come from the oxford group there's a great book called the eight points of the oxford group that i really love um and 
Yeah, no, that's something different. So that would give you a little more background on that. I guess just for me, like I said, this is my experience is the purity is I could just see the absolute devastating effects of separating my heart from another human being. One of the ways I suffered the most in this program is, is in my illnesses. I have a victim mentality. I could take anything you say or do and make it like you're doing something against me. And then I find out, wow, they weren't even, that's not even close. So when I recognize that victim mentality, as um, soon as I believe that somebody's doing something to me, I think, oh, there it is. It's like insanity of a woman coming across the street saying, hey, you know, my husband's gone. If you guys need anything, let me know what may come. That's just not real. What may come to my mind. The same way with, I practice that I'm going to act like the insanity of they're they're really not doing something to me here. And I'm going to pray because most times it's not. So that's the purity, I think, in my heart. I, I think of a story where there's a story of where somebody was nailed up to a cross and they were doing it to him. And he said, God forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And that's the type of heart I want to have where I live defenseless, where I'm not going to be living, um, trying to protect it. I'm going to allow God to do all that for me. Pass. Thank you, Dennis. I, and 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 that leads me into another question that I wrote about here. You know, the, the apostrophe S yes on the self. And you talked about how the self isn't necessarily evil or bad. It's really just trying to protect me from what it deems as dangerous out there. And um, uh, talk to us a little bit more about that as you let into that. Hey, because I really, or the self really does want to keep me safe, keep me, um, you know, from, from being damaged by somebody else or something else. Uh, talk a little bit more about living defensive or defenselessly. Yeah, that's my when my sponsor. When I first came to my the sponsor I have now, um, one of the first things he had me do is run on 60 when it says, the first requirement is that we be convinced that any life run on self-will can hardly be a success. That voice, I always thought was my voice. And he had me put an apostrophe S there. And that paradigm shame that or that shift of self-will is not you, Dennis. It says on 62 that I'm, that I'm being driven by a hundred forms of fear, selfishness, self-centeredness, that I'm being driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion. And I couldn't see that until I could. And when I could see that, I thought, oh my gosh, I can hear it in meetings. I can see it in everything where, um, I guess the best way I'll say it is that self's will, which is my ego, my pride and all of that, and the way it's trying to take care of me is if I'm not going to be connected to God, then I'm going to need to medicate with something. So it's always offering. Is there such a thing as spiritual attack? I believe there is. Is the self's will the enemy? Some say so. I don't know. And uh, the, the question was basically, um, the self isn't necessarily bad or yeah. evil. It's trying to protect me and talk about a little bit about living a defenseless life, being willing to not have to protect myself from all sorts of different things. Yeah, that my protection can only come from one place, and that's connection to the power. And my self's will took care of me as a little kid and as I started to grow, because it took it, it gave me ways to be able to relieve, to find relief of the things in life that were really what I found out was just a disconnection from my higher power. But once I connected to that power, I, I didn't suffer anymore like I, I was suffering. When the self tries to take care of me, it's I, when I'm in self's will, I'm full of fear because I'm trying to um, take care of myself. Let's let's jump over to another question here that I have for you, though, in the meantime. Okay. You know, you, you mentioned about, and this was a, a something that made me scratch my head and go, I want to learn more about this as you shared this. You talked about, you know, when you step on shore, you know, maybe you were fighting for that concept of acceptance, acceptance, you know, as, as mentioned in the big book being, being, you know, if I'm, if I'm in acceptance is the way things are, I'm at peace, but you oftentimes I find myself trying to force that acceptance. And you said, you know, when I step onto shore, acceptance is just 
basically given me. It's it's not a I'm not forcing it. It just happens. Um, uh, talk to us a little bit about that. Trying not to. Well, I, the the terminology I would use is white knuckle myself into yeah. acceptance rather than just accepting acceptance. Yeah. When I'm in self, I'm trying to. I was trying to manufacture acceptance. I remember uh, one of the most probably devastating things in my life was in 2020. I found out that I had a very powerful form of uh, prostate cancer, and at first I was shocked. But then I went in and prayed, and I tell you, the peace and serenity came, and God laid on my heart, Dennis, there will be a gift in this. And I won't go into what that gifts were. It was just amazing. So acceptance was that I trust that God has this, however it turns out. Even to the point, if it takes my life, I felt peace and serenity. In my disease, I could not have uh, dealt with that like that. I would have had to medicate with something. Um, Yeah, so... It's it's really about, I think the presence of God changes everything. It's it's not something I'm manufacturing. Yeah, thank you so much, Dennis. And thanks for sharing a little bit of that experience. Um, I've got another question that came in from our live audience. This is from Roz. Um, and this is about resentment and letting go of resentment and maybe practicing some of that uh, purity um, and some of these uh, absolutes in here. How do I let go of blaming a family member who bribed me to move out of state um, during COVID and from a place she'd lived for 20 years. She said, this, Ross says, I'm miserable here. She bribed me by buying a house I'd rent from her and kept, keep my low, my rent low forever. Uh, and, and, and she hates it financially. She feels she has no choice now. How do I love myself enough to take care of me? Well, about the person first, and then ultimately it's God's will that you ended up there. I have to realize that once I can truly see just how damaging self's will is, it's either going to build me up above others or it's going to beat me down. It can't stay in the present moment. But once I'm free from self's will, then it's very clear when I look at the people around me how much they're in their self's will. They're not doing it to me. They're just doing it to benefit them. So I get to have... Um, tolerance and love and patience for them. They, um, I don't know her motives or the person's motives that brought you down there. But if in acceptance, I believe that that was God's will for something, some reason. Um, it's, I would pray, for, number one, I, I would pray for that person until you feel nothing but love and acceptance, never to be brought up or charged about against this again. And then turn this whole thing over to God. Say, God, where would you have me? Because there is, there must be some positives to being down there. You know, um, it's we've had the snowiest month in Alaska here, and somebody that left here wrote back how much they missed that. Yeah, it's both. It's like yes, the trees are beautiful, everything is beautifully white, and there's a hardship to it. So it's, I think it's about where's my focus? Where am, Can I be thankful for where I'm at in this moment? And if that's where God would have me, then I'm going to try to um, make the best of that, or not even make the best of it, to believe that God has a purpose there for me. Every time I travel, if I miss a plane, then I know he has a person that I will run into. And sure enough, every time when I'm open to that, I'll meet some, I'll have some not chance encounter and God will pour out. I can always tell when he's pouring out. And uh, so I would say, number one, pray for them so that you don't have the resentment. And if it's God's will that you will leave there, he'll take care of the finances, but it may be that he has a purpose for you there. I don't know. Thank you for walking through that, Dennis. I appreciate that. All right. Um, one of the things that I wrote down here, one of the experiences you shared, you talked about, uh, I believe it's one of your sponsees who was, uh, and you were talking about where and why am I trying to escape? And you talked, this guy went to cookies, you know, and it kind of disturbed some things. Now, cookies in and of themselves may not, may or may not be bad for somebody, but if it's blocking me from God, talk, talk to us a little bit about recognizing where and why am I trying to escape and addressing those issues? Well, I think it has to be, like every morning when I wake up, I slide out of bed and do my prayer work every morning, have meditations in the morning. 
and try to like meditation happens all day long and I just want to be with God. And I guess the question that I get to ask myself is some days I wake up and I could just feel God's presence. Like, whoa, I'm like, whoa, thank you, God. This is so amazing. Um, and some days I wake up and there's noise. Like I don't, I used to, my first five years, if I waked up, if I woke up and laid in bed, a, a lustful thought would come and I would have to slide out of bed right away. I don't know why it just would. Man, I can lay there for a long time now and that's not the case. I wake up now and do my gratitudes. But the the the, the point that I was trying to make is as my what I used to escape before and be in full connection with God, it seems as that circle shrinks, I can't still do those things and have what I used to have. It's almost like, God, where are you? Well, and I can't say for sure that's what God is doing, but I'm just telling you what my experience is. God is bringing me um, closer to him and closer to him. What am I willing to give up that I'm using today? instead of hanging out with him. Am I in myself? Well, it's anything but God. Right? I mean, I'm anything. And that sounds like that shrinking circle concept you talked about a little bit earlier, right? Yeah. Expound on that just a little bit more, that shrinking circle concept that you that you mentioned earlier. Well, when I first came in, if I had a lust temptation, like there'd be this tidal wave of lust hit me. It was because of, of resentment. Um, God would still remove my lust like that. And I didn't know it was because I had a resentment because I hadn't gone through those principles. So his protection was big and he would just constantly, you know, take it. And man, I was just feeling like the pink cloud and everything was great. But as I learned my principles, as we go through the 12 steps and we start learning more principles, I believe more is required. And part of that is that God's not going to, if I'm going to stay in my self's will, we'll just say with resentment, God's not going to remove those things I medicate that resentment with. I'm not free unless I'm just going to white knuckle, like you said, and just suffer. That suffering will not be removed. But I believe it's like a little baby when we didn't know God would take it. But now as that circle shrinks, hey, you got a resentment. You're like I get a guy that'll call me. I feel like I'm getting ready to act out if he hasn't already taken a drink. And I'll go, well, what's your resentment? No, 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 you don't get it. It's, it's no, 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 no. What's the resentment? Do you have a resentment or some fear? Yeah, I'm really angry at this person. I said, well, pray for that person. Like off of page 552 until you're free from it. I said, there's no third option. So I believe what God's doing with me, I'll just speak about me, is to start giving up more of what I use to medicate which on the outside, if you looked at it, it's like, well, that's not a bad thing. It's not. A cookie's not bad. Watching a show isn't bad. But what is the motive in my heart when I do it? Am I escaping? Am I medicating with it? If I am, God's not going to punish me for that. But I believe that I'm in my disease. And if I stay there long enough, I'll return to my main disease, which I never want to go back to. That's my belief. And I can't say what's right for another person. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that, Dennis. One of the things that uh, I'm, I'm trying to put myself in the in the shoes of a newcomer listening to this, that shrinking circle, it sounds more uh, more and more confining, less and less free. Um, talk to me about how your experience may be that actually that makes you more free, perhaps. What are your, any thoughts on that or insights on that? Well, have you ever surrendered and been connected to God? And it's just beautiful. I mean, it's just like, oh my gosh. I feel so much joy. I feel free. I feel happiness. I love the people around me. I'm patient with them. I, I love this. Um, that's what it's like for me to be connected to the power. That's what it's like for me to be connected to God, to experience the consciousness of the presence of God. And that's, to me, that's recovery. That's the purpose of the program. It's not to quit lusting or acting out. It's so that I can have the consciousness of the presence of God in my life. And if God is, if I'm asking God every day, 
to remove, you know, in, in my third step prayer, relieve me of the bondage of the self. Well, how he does that is not how I'm going to understand. It's going to be all of a sudden one day, uh, the disciplines of the program, which are the principles, either I'm going to do them or I'm not. And if I let up on those, I'm going to feel the effects of that. Um, this is just my experience. I can't say it's true for anybody else, but it just seems like to me that God, there's there's a, a thing out of, of practicing the presence. I don't know if I can do this real quick. Let me see. The guy said, this is a practicing the presence of God by Brother Lawrence. It's, I consider myself the most wretched of men, full of faults, flaws, and weaknesses, and who has committed all sorts of crimes against his king. Touched with a sensible regret, I confess to him all my wickedness. I ask his forgiveness. I abandon myself in his hands that he may do what he pleases with me. Now, this is my God right here, the king full of mercy and goodness, very far from chastising me, embraces me with love, makes me eat at his table, serves me with his hands, serves me with his own hands, gives me the keys of his treasure. He converses and delights himself with me incessantly in a thousand and a thousand ways, treats me in all respect as his favorite. And thus I consider myself from time to time in his holy presence. I, I tell you, when God delights in me, he, and you. He loves you. He can't wait for you to turn and, and be in with him so that he can love you well. But we live in a fallen world, and I'm going to step back onto that bridge. And I believe that the protection, I can't, I can't stray as much. Because in the end, when I get out of that circle, I always love when I come home. It's like, oh my gosh, why did I leave here? I wish I could stay there forever. I don't know if that answers it. I think that's beautiful. Thanks for thanks for sharing that uh, from that uh, uh, reading there from practicing the presence of God and and just relating it. I, it made it very relatable to me. Um, before we close up, Dennis, do you have any final words of wisdom? Yeah, just well, follow your sponsor suggestions, but just utterly abandon yourself to God. Be willing to step to shore. Here's a man that we just worked yesterday is so. Uh, as a man of faith, he actually works in in, in uh, religious institutions. And while we read that, he goes, oh, my gosh, I'm afraid to step to shore. I'm afraid to let go of that. That's the awakening. When you can read page 53 and be afraid of letting go of those, you're well on your way. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dennis. Uh, big thanks. Uh, for a fantastic Rico 12 weekly speaker meeting. If we missed your question or if you have more, consider joining our WhatsApp community. To get in there, you email me at rico12pod at gmail.com to join in that conversation. If you're feeling inspired and want to share your insights on a three to four minute 12 step, sty 12 step style recording on the Rico 12 share speak pipe link, I'll put that uh, link here in the chat and in the show notes of the podcast. And if you haven't already done it, please rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts. It's a powerful way to work. Step 12. Make sure to check out the Afro Euro meet recordings that Karen A hosts on many Wednesdays. And as a heads up, we will not be having a live meeting next Friday on December 22nd. Next week, I'll be releasing a previously recorded conversation between a couple of uh, Rico 12 listeners, Everly and Ensley, and they are uh, the, the conversation will be on gratitude um, I'm grateful to release that next Friday as I'll be spending time with my family. The last Friday of the month on December 29th, we'll do a special live meeting intended to help us launch in our program. So stay tuned on WhatsApp in the WhatsApp community and on the email list for more information on that. If you're not on that email list or community, please send that email to rico12pod at gmail.com and ask to be included. Now let's launch off into the rest of our day with the submission prayer that Dennis will say for us. God, I give this day to you. Establish the work of my hands, the steps of my feet, the words of my mouth, the direction of my gaze, the thoughts of my mind, and the attitude of my heart. Amen. Amen. Everybody, th thank you, Dennis, and thank you, everybody, for being here. Remember, there is one who has all power. That one is God. May you find God now. Keep coming back. Let's trudge this road of happy destiny together. Work it. You are worth it.
escape of this life of mine Peaks too high to conquer Streams too wide to cross Troughs too deep to walk through Without incurring loss Yet here I am still standing tall Despite the rough terrain One like me Survive the storms and walk through wind and rain. Still standing, I will fight the good fight. Still searching for glimmers of light. Feet still on the ground. I can still be found. Standing still. Put